Hello, and welcome to the first of our fall 2021 Kessler Conversations. My name is Bo Adams, and I serve as director of Pitt's Theology Library here at Emory University, the home of the Richard C. Kessler Reformation Collection. The Kessler Conversations provide an opportunity to learn from experts about the debates and reforms in Europe in the 16th century, and to consider how contemporary communities may learn from these debates. This fall, I'm excited to begin our series on Luther and the Other, asking the question of how Martin Luther wrote about and interacted with those who differed from him ethnically and religiously, and what we can learn as we live in a globalizing society where interactions with those who are often deemed as the other are more and more frequent. I'm excited today to welcome as our first guest, Professor Anthony Bateza. Dr. Bateza is Associate Professor of Religion at St. Olaf College in Northfield, Minnesota, where he's also a program advisor in the Race and Ethnic Studies program. Dr. Bateza trained at Princeton Theological Seminary where he wrote his dissertation entitled, Becoming a Living Law, Freedom and Justice in the Ethical Writings of Martin Luther. He's a specialist in Luther, in moral theology and in Christian ethics, and his scholarly interests are in Luther's political theology, the relationship of the reformer to the virtue tradition, and the impact of Luther's thought on questions of race, identity, and social justice. At St. Olaf, he teaches courses in the religion department that connect theological and biblical questions with contemporary challenges. And so I think you can see that he is the perfect guest for us today. Joining us to discuss, at least Germans are honest, Martin Luther's appeal to ethnic identity and implications for social justice. So Dr. Bateza, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, well, thank you. It's a real honor to be here with everyone today and to all, all the folks watching online or perhaps watching later if we record the stream. Uh, I'm, I'm honored to be a part of this conversation, this series, and I'm excited to know that uh, uh, you all are hosting these kinds of conversations, keeping these kinds of topics alive and vibrant for folks. Well, it's great. I really appreciate your being here. I want to offer a quick note to those who are joining us live. Uh, as you can see on the right side of the screen, there is a space for question and answer. And while we certainly want to hear from Dr. Bateza, we also want to hear from you. And so throughout our conversation, if there are questions you have, uh, I invite you to put them into the Q&A. And then as we get to the end, as we have time, I will relay uh, some of those to Dr. Bateza. And then, of course, those that we do not have time to answer, we will send to him after the fact uh, through email. So I want to start our conversation today um, by offering you, Anthony, a, a, an opportunity to provide a broader introduction to who you are and what it is that you do in your scholarly work. And maybe I'll do so uh, by highlighting what it is personally that I find so interesting about your work. So mm -hmm. you were trained as a moral theologian, but your work focuses at least in part on the Reformation period and on teachings of Christian ethics from 500 years ago. So much of your scholarship relates to contemporary matters, but you always look at it through the realm of history. So I'm curious, how do you combine insights from the past into questions of the present? That is, by what reasoning or method do you bring to bear texts and figures from the 16th century to address questions that face us now in the 21st century? Mm -hmm. Well, let me answer that by doing a little bit of biography and see if that gets me to some of those methodological kinds of questions that you're asking. And so um, a few years ago now, when I was looking to do doctoral work, um, I was really struck by the question of how is it that Lutherans in general or Protestants uh, have received the, the virtue tradition? What, what's their thinking on, the, on formation, on character, on habit, and all these sorts of things? And I became interested maybe in looking at uh, current figures, people who are alive or died recently. I, I really enjoy the work of Dietrich Bonhoeffer and thought maybe there's some good things to do here. Uh, but the more research I did, the more reading I did as the years progressed, I kind of went further and further back into time. And I came to sense uh, in my formation that I really hadn't wrestled with Luther enough, uh, that I, I really needed to go back to Luther's impact and Luther's legacy on, on big questions of morality, of justice, of formation and politics. And so my, my sense has been that it's, it's sometimes easier to look for modern analogs uh, without necessarily digging into the historical materials, the, the older texts, and really, I think, wrestling with the legacies we are left with. Um, I myself am also a Lutheran and a Luther scholar. And so I think that those who have that kind of connection bear a certain responsibility for Luther as a figure and for um, the tradition that comes out of him. Uh, and so 
I think that's been an amazingly valuable experience for me. And I honestly can't imagine how it would address contemporary issues without at least taking a look backwards in some way or, or some form. Um, and quite honestly, as we look around us in the world, I'm more and more convinced about the repetition of certain kinds of issues, certain kinds of patterns that have really become um, quite clear for me because of the work I've done looking back 500 or more years. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. I mean, I think we're all uh, are wrestling in our heads with this idea of history repeats itself. And it's not exactly that history repeats itself, but it's always that history probably has experienced something similar to what we're talking about. And with appropriate interpretation, I think we can learn a, a lot from the past. So I very much appreciate that approach. Now, your title for the talk today, I find particularly interesting. So you're, you're talking to us about at least Germans are honest. And I note the question mark there, Martin Luther's appeals to ethnic identity and the implications for social justice. So I wanna pull that apart a little bit. Now I surmise from the title that you find Luther talking a lot or writing a lot about people who differ from him and, and probably ethnically is, is one way to think about that. So can you give us a brief overview of Luther's writings about the other, right? People who are different from he and who were these others and how does he go about addressing them? Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, yeah, I sort of uh, have that hanging question mark in my title to try and, and lure folks in a little bit to, to, to put the question out there. Um, so I think it's fairly well known that Luther um, has some longer engagements with others in his time, uh, at least those who are other to him, uh, particularly uh, folks who are Jewish and uh, the Turk or Muslims that, uh, more broadly. And so I'm excited to know you have a couple of talks coming down the road, and we'll get a, a taste of those later, uh, looking more in depth at those, at those subjects. What I, I'm focusing on or interested in um, are a series of passing comments that Luther sort of makes in a variety of places across his writing and across his life, where he's commenting on, uh, in one case, let's say peasants. Uh, as sort of a part of, of the same German people that he's a part of, but also clearly different in terms of class and trade and geography sometimes. And uh, also what he has to say about Italians or the Swiss or the French. Uh, these are sort of three of his most common targets of others. Uh, part of the reason I'm drawn to this is I, I, my sense is that uh, most interpreters of Luther, most writing on Luther just sort of blows right past these comments. Uh, sort of taking it for granted that, yes, he has some things to say about the Italians and the Romans and, and the Swiss and what have you, not really seeing a lot of weight in these comments. Um, I think that's in part because we've sort of um, are soaking in the sort of uh, sometimes amusing uh, intercultural differences that folks reflect on uh, amongst European peoples today. Um, but what I think is interesting is that, you know, Luther's making these comments and he's living in a time, I would say, before we have the rise of modern racialized thinking, um, where the colonial expansion is beginning, uh, the new world is being uh, discovered and, and exploited uh, in certain kinds of ways. But Luther is just sort of right on, on the cusp of this. And the later kinds of racialized taxonomies that we see in the 17th century, let's say 18th century, um, aren't a part of Luther's world. So he's not thinking like that. What he is doing, though, is he's talking about different groups uh, often by describing their identity linked to something about their behavior, uh, their cultural practices, and what I'm really interested in, often their virtues and vices. Um, so he isn't thinking in essentialist terms. If you're Italian, you're going to be this because of genetics, because of whatever, um, or German, what have you. But he does think there are certain uh, sort of characters of, of personality, of habit, of political behavior uh, that he sees clumping around these different kinds of designations of Italian or Roman or Swiss. Uh, so for example, he often makes sort of a passing joke about the Swiss being mercenaries, uh, which is of course a well-known uh, observation about their military involvement, uh, but uses that to make claims about sort of our mercenary eyes when it comes to our relationship with God and justification, sort of using it almost as a, a slur or a pejorative uh, reference there. And then when it comes to, let's say the Italians, uh, a subject he likes to talk on a lot, um, he talks about the Italians and sort of links them to Epicurean philosophy and other kinds of observations that he makes in which they really enjoy pleasure and fine wine and soft clothing. He makes these sorts of comments versus the Germans who are drinking beer and wearing wool, right? <laughs> there's, a, uh, there's a toughness, there's a stoutness uh, to the German people that he wants to appeal to. 
Now, in some ways, this, of course, could be troubling, uh, making these kinds of stereotypes, these kind of generalizations about people. Um, but I think it's interesting the way that Luther tries to leverage these, um, both as sort of a pejorative description of other people, but as sort of a call to arms for his own people. And so, for example, in his commentary on Psalm 101, which is sort of a mirror for princes document that he writes uh, kind of in the middle of his life, middle of his career, uh, he makes these comments about, uh, listen, in Italy, uh, they have these kinds of issues that they're evolving into, but at least in Germany, uh, people are honest. And if we hold on to honesty, and if we hold on to this sense of saying things truthfully and straightforwardly and simply, that's going to be uh, the key to us persevering both in the Reformation efforts and politically as a nation. And he says once people stop being honest, once they fall back onto, let's say, uh, using money to secure relationships and not the honesty of their word, uh, he says, then everything sort of falls apart. Um, and he says, you know, people start breaking treaties, uh, husbands start lying to their wives and wives are lying to husbands. And he sort of sees this uh, quickly uh, sliding into sort of chaos. Um, and so I put the question mark in my, in my title there because I think um, there's something dangerous in this appeal to the Germans being honest and the Italians not. Um, but there's something also in interesting to me about wanting to call people to um, their better nature. Uh, you know, that nature is sort of a second nature, an acquired nature, a habit, a disposition. Uh, so he's claiming that Germans are more honest and then demanding that they sort of live out this honesty in their political and social and religious relationships. So as an aside, I'm just kind of curious. So for these particular works where he's talking about the other, the Italian, the Swiss, et cetera, do you get mm -hmm. the sense that he's addressing a German audience? So it really is kind of an insular audience or, or argument to the Germans and othering these other nationalities is just a way of kind of strengthening his argument to his own people? That is a part of it, yes. Uh, he is writing to his own people. Uh, in most places I'm looking, he's generally writing in German for German audiences. He's writing to John Frederick or to others, hoping they'll read this. Whether they read it or not, we're not, we're not really sure. Um, and so he is sort of playing to the in crowd. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's sort of different than we see sometimes. It's kind of a, a cheap uh, insider language or sort of the, the, the proto-nationalism we might see of like, at least we're, we're Germans are good and all Italians are bad. Um, I think there's something slightly different going on. Uh, I don't think he's trying to sort of drum up a, a nationalist interest, uh, but I think he is trying to find ways to call out uh, what he sees as dangerous trends and vices among his own people. Um, and he sort of takes back what he gives with one hand uh, later on. So there, there are places, for example, we'll talk about how great the king is, how great the ruler is, or what have you. And then at the end, he'll say, but of course, things are actually quite horrible uh, here locally. And most of our, our princes are, are not great at being princes. They, they grew up uh, spoiled. Uh, they only care about themselves, yada, yada, yada. And so he's not kind of slipping into this, this sort of just pure othering of outside peoples and this sort of romanticized image or elevation of people internally, which I think is quite common sometimes with these kinds of otherings. Um, but he's sort of moving back and forth. And yes, using the other, the outsider as a foil, uh, mm -hmm. but using it to sort of criticize and hopefully encourage uh, a certain kind of behavior amongst his own community, amongst his own people. So as we kind of think about that, I mean, one of the things you referenced was there's a danger in reading a text where someone is talking bad about another group, right? That the way that text can be read. So I think if we pull it forward to our kind of contemporary situation, you know, I think we all recognize that inequities in our society, those based on race or class or socioeconomic status during the pandemic have been exacerbated. And I think appropriately so are now at the forefront of our minds and our conversations. So I think as, as we increasingly recognize that our world is experienced very differently from people based on the way they look or the backgrounds from which they come, how, you know, what can we learn from a figure like Luther, who, as you say, has a bit of a complex relationship with those who are different than he? So how can we take a figure like Luther and, and, and use his writings to address the inequality that we face, to create a more just society, to encourage, you know, our fellow citizens to just love the neighbor? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think one of the, the benefits of Luther, something that is probably fairly well known by the folks listening right now, is that Luther really wants to drive a wedge between this idea of good works and salvation or justification. Right? So now our good works, the good things we do for our neighbors aren't earning us uh, a space out of purgatory or into heaven, uh, but they are truly there just to serve the neighbor's needs, what the other needs. 
and there's sort of a long tradition of, uh, of Protestant moral reflection and political institutions, particularly in Scandinavia and Germany, but here in the United States as well, with Lutheran services in America and other kinds of organizations that still pull from that tradition to try to say that, listen, uh, Luther commands this sense of neighbor love, of service to other, um, this is something that God desires um, and is not, uh, again, for mercenary purposes, not to earn your way into heaven. One of the challenges then is to try to figure out, um, I'm supposed to serve my neighbor, but what exactly does my neighbor need? Right? What does that mean? Uh, and I've heard many of folks speak to and sort of say, we have to go help people. Like, yes, we do. Uh, what should we do? I'm not really sure. Um, and then Luther, I think, um, runs into this problem as well sometimes. Um, sometimes he, he will write and speak as if we automatically know what our neighbor needs. We just need to get out there and do it and help our neighbor. And I think he sort of takes for granted that we know what our neighbor's needs are sometimes. Uh, he's living in a different kind of community, a different kind of culture than we are. I think he has a sense that you can just kind of see uh, on people's faces. You can kind of see it in your small town of Wittenberg or wherever you are. You know what, what, what Bill down the street needs. You know what Susie needs. You know what they're going through. And so one thing I think we need to do to sort of pull Luther from the past into today is to take a, take a pause and ask ourselves whether or not we actually know what our neighbor needs. Um, and the pandemic, as you pointed to, has really exposed some of the challenges with this, right? Um, we might have assumed all kinds of things about the food insecurity or security of, of children in our community, of the elderly, of access to health care and medical care, uh, all sorts of things. And so really uh, calling into question sometimes our hubris in that we actually know what needs our neighbor has and our ability to let the neighbor speak for themselves and to actually listen to and receive what they're offering when they say that they need something. That's, that's really interesting. So the things that Luther could take for granted, perhaps in our society, we don't take for granted. And so in order to apply Luther, we kind of have to do a little bit of the legwork uh, beforehand um, to hear the neighbor. I think that's really uh, interesting. I'm, I'm curious. I mean, this is just my own curiosity. Maybe others share it. Mm -hmm. When you teach this to your students, so your students who I presume have at the forefront of their mind social justice inequalities in our society and want to solve that, and you're asking them to take a pause and go back and consider someone from 500 years ago, is that a tough move for them? Are they receptive to thinking historically about issues that are so pressing in their lives? Mm -hmm. You know, it is, it is a tough move. Um, it's a tough move for me as well. I won't just put it on my, on my students. Um, I think sometimes when you're teaching undergraduates, there can be something of a sort of a knee-jerk reaction. If something matches what I already believe, they get really excited about it. Something seems wrong or bad. It's, oh, listen, get rid of this person, get rid of this idea. We've got to dump it real fast. And so when we get to, the, to Luther's writings against the Jews, for example, uh, they no more Luther, I don't want any more of this. So trying to make things a little more complicated for them on, on those lines. Um, and, and I think one of the hardest things for myself and for my students to grasp in making this jump back and forth is that um, I think it's okay to talk about particularity and, and, and sort of the claims that individuals make, the kind of identities individuals claim um, and how that changes their, their practices, their beliefs, their community, um, that that is not necessarily a bad or a good thing. Sort of approach that with a little bit more open-mindedness, a little bit more flexibility, right? So they will read things in the Bible about your beha behave certain ways, don't do certain things, and like, ah, oh, that, that's it's, it's uh, oppressive, that's sort of um, mm -hmm. uh, being forced to, to do certain kinds of things. They see Luther using the same kind of language sometimes. It's like, oh, I, we don't like any of that. Here in America, we can do whatever we want. We have freedom, and they didn't have freedom back then. And so one of the tasks then is to complicate that and sort of say, what is it today that you take to be freedom? And how is it that all of your um, these freedoms are so often constrained, uh, so often are chosen unreflectively, um, and those sorts of things. And then in Luther's time to kind of see uh, how is he actually more open and capacious than you might give him credit for? And how is he more closed-minded than you might have even realized some of the things that seem open and capacious? Yeah, I, I think that's, I mean, you highlight so well one of the challenges that I think historians or people who work with historical figures face, and that is answering that question of why should we listen to someone who on the surface says things that we find deeply offensive or deeply problematic? And I think it's it's not an easy answer, but I think the way you're working through it is really an important way for, for students to appreciate uh, the value of historical figures and kind of answering some of these questions. So, yeah, I think a lot of 
So a lot of historians and folks who are sensitive to these things, we've tried to be more attentive to neither sort of lionizing nor castigating uh, figures in the past, just sort of demonstrating that for students, letting them see what that looks like in practice, um, and letting them decide for themselves you know, when, when a course is over, when a reading is done. If you want to keep with this figure, if you want to hold on to it, that is your choice. I'm sort of giving you the tools and empowering you to, to do that. Um, but of course, by having readings, by assigning figures like Luther, I am endorsing in some way uh, mm -hmm. the value of engaging uh, such a person. And so um, that makes for complicated, but I think really important conversations. And I think um, you know, once the students have built up some sort of trust in the classroom, once people have some trust that you're going to uh, be open to different kinds of questions, to be open to criticism and sort of engage in this longer conversation, that becomes a lot easier. When things are just popping up intermittently on social media or flying past us at 100 miles an hour, it's a lot harder to develop that kind of trust needed to spend the time to sit with these historical figures and their complicated legacies. Well, and it also occurs to me, I mean, you spoke in the beginning about your dual context in the sense that you also are engaged with the church, right? And I imagine mm -hmm. the situation of the church is quite different. That is, Luther has a certain inherent authority because he is Luther. And in, in many ways, you have to fight against the proclivity perhaps to take Luther wholesale, right? So you kind of have to complicate him, whereas for students, it is you have to uncomplicate him in some ways. Yes, that's exactly right. So sort of trying to get a sense of where your audience is, um, not just not to complicate things just to, for the sake of complication, um, but to really try to bring that, that kind of nuance and complexity and the sense that, you know, that is an important exercise in unsettling your opinions and your beliefs, um, even if you come back to them at the end, uh, but that movement through uh, that unsettling, that questioning will perhaps strengthen your resolve uh, one way or the other, um, but in a more thoughtful, uh, a, a more, again, reflective sort of way. Yeah, no, that, that's great. I think that's why it's so important that people like you and here at, at Candler, we kind of sit on the boundary of the academy and the church, and it's, it makes things so exciting, right? Because you have these, these multiple audiences to address these questions with. So I, I wanted to talk, you mentioned earlier about part of your work, you've worked on the Peasants' War, right? Which is an uprising in the, the 1520s in German territories um, that was in many ways prompted by Luther's reforms, a kind of empowerment of the lower classes over against the nobility. And it seems to me that this particular episode is really relevant to what you're talking about, because one of the arguments of the peasants in that situation was what we might call today a kind of systemic injustice, right? There is systemic inequality, and the uprising was a way to kind of fight back against that. And what's maybe interesting about Luther is, while I think we're, many of us are familiar that he decries the violence and he thinks that, you know, that shouldn't happen. And while he, he does give a little bit of credence to the peasants' arguments, ultimately he does little in terms of encouraging their reform of the system. And I, I just mm -hmm. wrote down here a quote from your own work, quote, Luther does not question the political arrangements that preceded and arguably caused the current conflagration. In short, he has difficulty conceiving of a response to issues where the just systems or structures produce injustice. So we talk a lot these days about systemic inequality and the problems with some of the kind of big systems that are operable. How do we reckon with, with Luther who doesn't really help the peasants in that kind of fight? Does it, does maybe this provides cover for people who sit at the top of unjust systems today? Mm -hmm. No, that's excellent. Um, yeah, I sort of find myself often drawn to topics in Luther that are somewhat um, problematic or at least viewed as problematic. And so Luther is seen as an enemy of virtue. And I want to say he's not. And Luther is seen as going totally wrong on the peasants war. And I want to say, well, maybe it's a, a little more complicated than that. Um, and uh, so with the peasants war specifically, um, yes, Luther is in some ways ambivalent or at least playing both sides uh, when he initially responds to the uprisings in 24, 25. And he wants to say, listen, the, the princes and the rulers are despicable. Right? They're, they're horrible. Um, they're oppressing the people. And just for some background context for those who don't know, um, what the, the princes and rulers and other temporal rulers have been doing uh, was sort of increasing levies and taxes and that kind of thing. They've been closing off hunting ground and fishing ground uh, to sort of peasant folks who needed the, the wild game and, and the protein uh, from that, that kind of activity just to sustain their diet. Uh, 
Um, and a lot of folks had found themselves essentially in, in forms of slavery, uh, various kinds of, of servitude uh, that were going away in other parts of Europe, but were still going strong uh, in some parts of, of, of Luther and the German speaking lands. And so, um, and also the legal systems have been changing. So there've been a shift away from sort of common law traditions uh, um, of the German peoples, more towards sort of a unified use of Roman law, uh, which invariably helped the, the rulers and those on top and didn't help those on the bottom. And so Luther, uh, as I understand him, is aware of these trends, aware of these realities, and says that all of this is a bad development. All of this is being uh, implemented by bad princes. And this uprising is to be blamed on these princes and on, on their behavior. Nevertheless, um, he thinks that the peasants, right, uh, certainly can't appeal to violence, uh, certainly can't take up arms, and can't depose whatever rulers are out there running around. Um, and so what I think is interesting then is that Luther has this sort of both sides uh, piece to his analysis of the situation, right? Uh, the peasants are being oppressed, they're right about that, but the, they can't resist the princes, uh, by arms at least. What I find positive though, is that Luther does think they can resist the princes by other means, Right? And so one of the things that gets overlooked is he says, listen, you should be engaged in these debates and these conversations and legal cases. And he says to the princes, you need to meet with the peasants. You need to come to some sort of agreement. You need to resolve these things in some sort of, um, you know, some sort of non-violent, uh, non-coercive way, we might say. And, and I find that to be a rather positive assessment of things. Um, and to those who worry that he doesn't have, uh, sort of encourage the peasants in the revolt against the system, um, I think I, would, I was more worried about Luther in the past. As time has gone by, I've started to see some of the wisdom and his wariness or concern about uh, mob violence, let's say. Uh, particularly this last year, I suppose, since January 6th and the attack on the US Capitol, right? Um, Luther's sense here is that, um, first of all, mob violence is not working through the, the means of good order, the means of, of law, the means that God has established. So there's problems there immediately. Uh, he also thinks that those who engage in this kind of violence to depose leaders usually end up with worse leaders after the fact. Uh, he says, you know, tear one person down and get somebody even worse. And he has all these sort of anecdotes and stories that he tells about this happening. He also has a sense that the, the mob is in fact being exploited by particular individuals. So he thinks that there's people sort of riling up the mob for their own benefit. So that their concerns for the poor, their concerns for injustice are disingenuine. Uh, and in fact, they have their own economic and political uh, sort of eyes open and they're trying to make a grab at something for themselves. And while we might disagree with Luther's assessment if this is happening or not in the particulars of the Peasants' War and the particulars of those various uh, uprisings, um, I think the instinct to say uh, that just countering injustice with, with mob violence or deposing or completely changing the system um, is dangerous. Um, I also don't know how practical it is. When I think about the current situation in the United States or in other countries around the world, um, my sense is that um, there's some naive optimism in our ability to quickly and radically rechange a political system or a social structure. Uh, I think Luther's sentiment that these things take time, that sort of a long, hard, slow slog across the years, um, more accurately represents the reality that many groups, uh, for example, Black folks in this country have felt. Um, there's no one moment you can point to where a revolution happened. It's been a series of fight and a lot of work by a lot of people ongoing into the present and God willing into the future. Um, where I would sort of fault Luther, though, uh, is I think that when he sees sort of an emergency situation, what he thinks is an emergency of some kind, when there's you know violence happening, um, he too quickly slides into, um, you know, as he says, in a, a against the murdering, robbing hordes, you know, slay them, smite them, strike them down. Uh, he took too quickly and too um, sort of most emphatically, passionately, sometimes joyously, embraces this image of the princes and the soldiers putting down the rebellion and teaching those who have risen up uh, an important lesson, making an example of them almost. Um, and so uh, his slide into that and his own sense of his self-justification in doing so, even when friends come up to him and say, you should apologize. He says, I'll apologize. My apology is no, no apology whatsoever. Uh, he makes those kind of moves. Um, so I think that that shows that, that Luther um, has good instincts about the complexities of these realities. But when pressed or, or when he feels like he's pressed or facing an emergency, um, he can quickly or too easily slide 
into this kind of more authoritarian uh, hardline um, um, response. I deeply appreciate the nuance. You, you know, we tend to have a, a, a tendency to say either Luther all good or Luther all bad. And, and it's, it's very evident that the, the nuance and the, the care with which you are reading these sources to say, there's a lot here and some of it's good and some of it's bad and we need to engage that uh, to learn. Um, it's also a little bit terrifying, but interesting how relevant some of these kind of questions of violence and of, as you point out, are, are so uh, relevant in our particular American context. So uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, I, I want to yeah, ask sorry, now, this is a, a selfish library question, so I apologize for that in advance. Now, as I began the beginning, I, I said I'm, I'm, I'm very much a fan of your work because in many ways you embody what we're trying to do with the Kessler Collection. That is, we collect a lot of old things, but we don't see our mission as ending in collecting. It is to maximize the impact of these old things and to draw out these conversations about contemporary issues. So. We spend a lot of time and we spend a lot of energy collecting old books. And a lot of people will say to me, you know, it's the digital age. Things are online. We don't need to spend all these energies collecting old books. So in the same vein of asking what's the relevance of reading old texts, let me ask you, what do you perceive as the value of doing the scholarly work of collecting, preserving, and providing access to the physical objects from 500 years ago? Is there, is there value in this kind of research? And I'm hoping so because that's what we do. Yes, there, there most certainly is value Good. and a great deal of it. Um, that isn't to say that sort of the digitization of things isn't, uh, isn't important and isn't really helpful for getting at broader access to people all over the place. But having people who are collecting and curating these sources is immensely important. Uh, um, they can sort of put together um, in, in a physical sort of tactile way um, what these sources look like, what they felt like, what, what they what kind of shape and, and smell they had. Um, I will say we have some uh, of these materials here at St. Olaf. Uh, we have a fairly large special collections for Norwegian, Norwegian American and Norwegian history bits and a smaller collection for Lutheran Reformation stuff. But I've used some of our own collections in the classroom with students and, and they have genuinely been amazed and just sort of transfixed on this experience of actually getting to touch um, with gloves, usually, um, and to sort of look through and to see just the size, the shape, the printing, uh, to notice things that you just can't notice uh, in a digital format. Um, and to see, you know, oftentimes these uh, pieces that we're collecting have come through various owners right across the ages. Uh, there'll be things in the manuscript, little notes, little uh, comments. And you can sort of see the reception, the history, the transmission of these ideas, of these texts uh, that you're just not going to get uh, from some sort of plain HTML text um, that's online or in some database. And, and I think that it makes uh, people appreciate um, just how valuable these sources were to people, just having these printed materials uh, was uh, in, in that time. Uh, how much care went into their construction, uh, the artwork, the woodcuts, all that sort of stuff. Um, I think that's immensely helpful. And to sort of circle back to what we said earlier uh, about sort of unsettling people, um, I think there's one experience we have in reading things online in a digitized sort of way um, that is important, but it's different than the sort of uh, uh, collection and use and putting your eyes on and hands on physical materials books and, and um, pamphlets and this sort of thing. Uh, it really uh, unsettles your experience, it really forces you to slow down. And I think it really um, forms things in your mind differently. I think that the research backs this up, that there's something to the physical resources and having the physical resources. Finally, my, my only thought here is that there's something about the collecting of resources speaks to the, what we value, what we take to be important. Uh, I think there's no doubt that we value uh, our online world and the digital world that we have, uh, the apps and the programs and all these kinds of things. There's a lot of money, uh, billions of dollars being invested in there. And I think by comparison, investing in the collection of these texts says something about what we are invested in. So where we're putting our treasure and our time says something about how we are invested in the past, our forebears, our ancestors, their words, their lives, uh, that we're taking the care and the time um, to not just focus on what's happening now in this digital age, uh, but looking back and giving them the care and attention they deserve. Yeah, that, that's so well said. I mean, I think any of us who've had the privilege of introducing students to physical objects in a library, mm -hmm. and you kind of get that sense of awe and grandeur. Um, actually, I was 
conversing with someone who's on this call, Rod Hunter, who was comparing it to touring a biblical site, that you will never read the biblical text the same without having experienced the, the, the physical location. I think similarly for these texts, I mean, I, I think about it oftentimes, we show students, we talk about Luther's use of technology in the pamphlet, but it's quite another thing to give them a 16th century pamphlet to hold in their hands, to feel how light it is, how easy it would have been to produce, gives you a sense of why these things were so popular and sold so uh, widely and why uh, he had such an impact. Um, so I, I want to turn now, we have a number of questions that have come in uh, in the Q&A, and I think they're quite insightful. So I mean, it, it, with, if you're willing, I'm going to put you on the spot here and ask a couple of these. Um, the first is at the top of my list, which comes from Rod Hunter, who I just mentioned. It says, what direct personal experiences did Luther have of people significantly different from himself, ethnically, culturally, or religiously? Did he ever have an experience of an other that significantly impacted or changed his thinking or moral commitments? Mm, that's a great question. Uh, I would say generally no, uh, right? Uh, by and large, Luther lived uh, his entire life uh, in Saxony uh, with a, a brief trip to Rome and an occasional trip to Worms. Um, and so he didn't, uh, and while in Saxony, while in Wittenberg and other areas, he was really limited in the kinds of people he engaged with. We're not even sure he actually had a chance to meet uh, a living a Jewish person. So he's sort of writing about other people's reports on them. Uh, not He's not meeting Turks. He's not meeting, uh, he met some Italians through various sort of uh, papal envoys and that sort of thing and his trip to Rome, uh, but not very often. Right. So more often than not, he's relying on either uh, writings that are uh, predating him. Uh, so he makes a lot of use of, uh, you know, uh, ancient Roman uh, rhetoricians writing about the Greeks and how bad the Greeks are. So he just says, you know, the Greeks are like this, obviously, and the, and the Latins are like this. Um, and he's relying upon sort of uh, experiences of others that are being reported to him. So people who are traveling, people who are seeing the world a bit more. Uh, and he also has sort of a, um, almost seems like sort of a naive, uh, wonder when he hears reports about things like the peasants were, for example, he sort of he gets reports on what's happening, the violence, and just sort of runs with it. Um, uh, and again, uh, it seems naive in some ways, but for myself, uh, I live on a certain sort of diet of social media and newspapers and periodicals. And so quite honestly, a lot of what I gather about people around the world comes to me through secondhand reports, through images and that kind of thing. Uh, but no, he is not uh, mixing interpersonally on a regular basis with the other. Yeah, I, I think that's helpful. And, and not to give too much of a preview for our next conversation, but I had the same talk with David Grafton, who will be with us next time, um, speaking about Luther's writings of, as you say, the Turk or his, his identification of Muslims, but tragically never interacted with one. And so in many ways, his description of the other is, as you described, just what he's heard largely from medieval texts. And it's not too far afield from our understanding of people who are other in our world that we've never had the, the privilege of, of interacting with. And we all recognize that it's quite a different thing to meet someone who holds different convictions or looks different uh, from you. Um, so one, one, one thing I wanna be careful about though, is that um, I think because you know I'm sort of middle class, I'm a college professor, right? I assume a certain sort of mobility of person uh, and I tend to travel in fairly uh, somewhat the North is not that diverse, but I travel in some diverse spaces and get to engage people who are other than for myself. Uh, on a fairly regular basis. Um, but Luther didn't have those opportunities, nor do a lot of people a lot of the time. And so what's interesting is I think is that Luther's experience of not being exposed to the other and its relationships is probably more common uh, today than we, than we realize. Um, probably is more the norm than it is the exception. So it might seem exceptional to some of us, but for whom we're like, oh, I, you know, I eat this kind of food, I went to these kinds of places, I've been all over the world. Uh, but for a lot of folks like where I grew up in Iowa, um, that may not be the case. Yeah, no, that, that's a really important uh, distinction to make. I appreciate that. Yeah. So let me move to a question from Susan Meyer, who asked, what would the world or what do you think the world would look like today if we did, in fact, learn from the past? So I guess the assumption here is that we're not doing as well or good a job as we should from learning from some of these lessons of the past. What would significantly be different, maybe particularly in the context of Luther? That's a great question. Um, I would suspect that we would be a bit more humble uh, would be my sort of easy, uh, straightforward answer to that question. Um, my sense in studying the past and studying history and reading these texts and, and about these events uh, has given me a greater sense of the complexity of the past and the complexity of the present. 
And so it's it's hard then to sort of rally around uh, images that say, you know, things were great and now they're bad, or things were bad and now they're great. This sort of repristination or sort of positivism we sometimes see with different uh, views on history and where things are going. Um, but I think we, if we pay more attention, if we study more carefully, we see that, listen, uh, things have been bad and good for different people, different groups, different places and times uh, over and over again. This doesn't say that everything's the same, you know, sort of all cows are black in the night uh, sort of thing. Uh, but it is to say that we would uh, sort of be less um, either demoralized about problems in the present or less uh, um, committed to a sense that things are great or need to be made great in, in some sort of way. Um, and I think as we see debates today, right, about the critical race theory or the teaching of race and slavery in America, we see people wrestling with uh, how to handle the history, how to handle this information, uh, and not doing a terribly good job of it, uh, quite frankly. Uh, either wanting to praise how far we've come or think we've come much further than we have um, in all kinds of ways that show to me uh, sort of a lack of humility about the sources and about, about our history. I think we could all uh, appreciate a, a call for a little more humility. That's a very, very much welcomed. Um, so let me ask maybe one more question. Um, and that is from Bowling Thompson here. It says, is your view that Luther's understanding of the other is that the differences are not ontological? Continuing, yes, the other differs more than superficially, but not enough to break an essential unity of humanity. I'm thinking that his view of the other, such as Jews and Turks, is pretty radical. So is the difference ontological, I guess, is the question. Um, I would say no, uh, right? So, so depends what you mean by ontology, I suppose, which would be another another lecture, another conversation. Um, but in the sense that I think Luther thinks a lot of these differences are formed in us through sort of culture, through upbringing, through political arrangements, wherever we happen to find ourselves. But he does think that they are sort of long lasting and enduring. Right? So he thinks the kinds of vices, let's say, uh, of a usury or of, of gluttony and drunkenness, he thinks that once these are sort of taken root, uh, they're really hard to unroot. And he makes appeals to sort of Jesus's weed and tares kind of argument, where, you know, you got to take out, take out the roots early on, otherwise it starts to grow, then you got to let it, let it go. Um, and so he, he does think that there are differences between groups, and he does speak about those strongly, um, but these aren't sort of reducible to genetic inheritable traits. Um, these aren't sort of unchangeable. They're just difficult to change, hard to change. And so he, I think he has a lot more hope for the youth, right? So to get them when they're young, uh, a focus on building, on formation, on, on education. Um, but then as you get to be, let's say a teenager or you know, in your forties, God forbid, uh, he thinks we're pretty, pretty set in our ways, which again, to me seems fairly accurate. Well, we're running short on time. So let me ask one quick question. If our audience wants to learn more, that is about Luther in general or about this particular topic of the other and, and kind of his description of people who he doesn't know, are there a couple of resources or resources too that you might recommend that our, our I'll describe myself as lay audience might uh, learn from or benefit from? Yeah, I think uh, your audience would be served well by just starting with a couple of decent biographies on Luther. After 2017, the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, there was sort of a uh, flourishing uh, of these. Uh, and so the works by, uh, let's say, uh, Scott Hendricks, Lindahl Roper, Volker Lapine, uh, these are folks who have written sort of nice, uh, some thick, some thin, accessible biographies. And reading a couple of different ones, I think, gives you a better sense uh, than just picking sort of one on the bestseller list or something like that. Picking a couple of different authors, different backgrounds, gives you a better sense of Luther's time and place. Um, I've always really appreciated um, the work of uh, um, uh, Mark Edwards on, on Luther and the False Brethren is one of his big books. Uh, thinking about Luther's relationship to other people who were close to him, who were friends, who he ends up fighting with. I think you get a real sense of how Luther can sometimes lump his own friends together, kind of other people who were close to him when suddenly the tide is turned and they're on the different side of a debate or an issue. And I think there's an important lesson to be learned there about friendship and about uh, too quickly, what, generalizing or lumping people together into, into enemies and friends. And Luther does that far too often. Um, otherwise, I think just getting into Luther's text with a nice uh, primary text with a good guide or a good volume will help you. Um, uh, Fortress Press did a series called The Annotated Luther a couple of years ago, and they're still out there in various forms and volumes. And they're nice, easy, readable texts. 
Uh, some are thinner, some are thicker. There's like a student edition and a longer one, but they have these really extensive footnotes. They have images and woodcuts, all that kind of stuff. I think students uh, and non-specialists find to be sort of a great entryway. Uh, they give you the history, they give you little introductory essays that are sort of brief and to the point, and then get you right into Luther's text itself, right into the primary material. Anthony, those are great recommendations. I can, uh, I agree with all of them. You need a great theological library, and fortunately we have one. And so if you, in, in the Atlanta area, come by, we have all these resources. Um, we'll also compile a full bibliography of all the texts, primary and secondary, that Anthony has mentioned, and we will send that out to all of you if you didn't get the chance to write them all down. So now that we're running up against 45, which is the time I promised to get you out of here, I want to thank Dr. Bateza for his work and, of course, for the conversation today. I want to thank all of you for being with us. Um, the next two parts of our Fall Kessler Conversations are upcoming. I'll show you a picture here maybe of the slides. Yep. So coming up in two weeks, we will have David Grafton of Hartford Seminary talking about Luther and Islam that we mentioned here. And then in November, we will have Dean Bell of the Spurtis Institute talking about Luther, Jews, and Judaism, certainly a controversial, interesting, and I think super important topic for us all. Otherwise, Dr. Bateza, thank you again for your work. Uh, I hope you all stay safe. I hope you all enjoyed our time today, and we'll look forward to seeing you soon at another uh, Kessler event at Pitt's Theology Library. Thank you very much. Thank you.